This is a production of WTVI PBS Charlotte. Just ahead on Carolina Impact. Teeing off for teachers at the Wells Fargo Championship. I'm Jeff Sonier. Stick around. We'll tell you how Charlotte's big annual golf tournament raises money to help fill empty classrooms. Is the program to hire teachers working or not? We'll have details. Can you still remember your high school's alma mater? Unfortunately, I can't, but we'll meet a woman who can after 60 years because she created it. And we introduce you to a new regular segment called One Tank Trips. This one takes us to a museum showcasing 100 years of aviation history. Don't go anywhere. A new season of Carolina Impact starts right now. WTBI PBS Charlotte presents Carolina Impact, covering the issues, people, and places that impact you. This is Carolina Impact. Funding for Carolina Impact is provided by the members of WTVI PBS Charlotte and by The Philip L. Van Every Foundation is pleased to support our region's arts organizations and artists with profiles and feature stories on Carolina Impact. Good evening, thanks so much for joining us. I'm Amy Burkett. It sounds like a great idea using Charlotte's successful and popular Wells Fargo Golf Championship as a fundraiser to help solve the teacher shortage in some of Charlotte's underperforming public schools. But after 10 years and millions of dollars donated by the golf tournament, what's the real effect of all that money on the problem of too few teachers? Carolina Impact's Jeff Sonier is at Quail Hollow Country Club with more. Well, Amy, here in Charlotte this time of year, not many places prettier or quieter than Quail Hollow. In fact, it kind of makes you want to use your quiet golf announcer voice, you know, on the 18th here, the par four for birdie. Of course, <laughs> when the real golf announcers are here at Quail Hollow during tournament week, the chorus is a lot different. The big name golfers, they bring out the big crowds. The big crowds bring the big money. And you may be surprised to find out that big money means a big donation that helps some of Charlotte's poorest schools hire hard to find teachers for empty classrooms. Please welcome Bill Nichols. Nicholson only one behind at the ninth second. They come for the stars and the under pars. Rory McElroy shares the top spot. And okay, maybe the outdoor bar. But here at Quail Hollow, while Charlotte golf fans follow their favorites. Webb Simpson on the tee of the 318 yard par four. This tournament's top money winner is a guy you've probably never heard of. His name is Tim Hurley, and no, he's not a very good golfer but he is executive director of Teach for America in Charlotte. The Wells Fargo Championship, um, what people don't know is that they work every year to raise money for charity. And so they've given $16 million to charity over the last 10 years. When the tournament started, they said, we want Teach for America to be the main beneficiary and that led us launched. And it's really been just an amazing 10 year partnership. TFA tells its story from a tent on the 10th fairway. How money from thousands of tournament ticket buyers allows Teach for America to place more than 100 teachers a year in Charlotte Mecklenburg's poorest schools. CMS also chips in a half million tax dollars annually for TFA teacher training and recruiting. We train teachers to work um, in low income schools and we recruit uh, teachers from all over. We go and we recruit people from all different backgrounds. That's one of the ways that we're unique. And at the start of another school year, as thousands of kids head back to classes with no permanent full-time teachers, well, that's when CMS and TFA team up in the scramble to fill positions that are still vacant. Often in schools where a lot of traditional teachers don't want to teach. It depends on the person. I, it depends on what they're willing to take on, the challenges that they're willing to face. Bethany Darnley is a TFA teacher who signed up for two challenging years at Geringer High. What class are you at? Uh, my first block. I'm in. Who's first block? Miss Rich. Okay. okay. Where somebody out in the Geringer parking lot actually shot out the side window of our TV truck while we were on campus talking with her. 
So the dropout rate is pretty high. All of the students know that. They're well aware of it. So we talk about the mindset of the student who drops out versus the mindset of the student who keeps pushing themselves. What What's the story on graduating? Next year. Okay. All that matters is that you show them that you care. That and just giving them the resources to be successful. There's definitely challenges with that as well. Are you going to do work? I can't do work in here. Okay. I like the challenge and I, I like being able to see the difference that I'm making in the day. That in itself is motivation for me. But critics argue that most TFA teachers are a lot more motivated by Teach for America's financial incentives for giving $10,000 of their college loans in exchange for their commitment to a two-year teaching job. No teaching experience or teaching degree required. Then they often simply bail out. I believe continuing a relationship with Teach for America is a slap in the face to, to people that have chosen to dedicate their lives to being career educators. Here in Durham, the Board of Education voted at this meeting last year not to use Teach for America teachers in their low-income classrooms anymore. Our staff, we have uh, many National Board certified teachers. Durham school board members and career teachers were also blunt about their reasons for dumping TFA. I have a problem with the, the two year and gone. I think our kids, particularly our kids who live in communities that are full of instability, deserve a lot better than that. A program that only trains five or six weeks in the summer tells the world that anybody can be a teacher and that's just false. They're not dedicated. They didn't intend to be teachers. They find uh, um, they find this is a quick route to getting their education debt paid off. In Charlotte, classroom People teachers President Judy Kidd agrees that TFAs don't solve the problem of teacher vacancies in low-income schools because most don't stick around. And Charlotte Mecklenburg School's own numbers show the average turnover rate for TFA teachers is more than 55 percent. That's how many TFAs leave CMS after two years of teaching or less. Last year it was 60 percent. A short-term band-aid. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's how TFA is viewed for the most part by career teachers? I think most people, if they step back and they look at it, in reality it is a short-term band-aid. There are very few TFAs who stay in the profession over the long term. Mickelson in with a birdie and out in 32. But the classroom teacher's president adds as long as Charlotte's golf tournament keeps raising money for TFAs, the school system will probably keep hiring TFAs, sort of par for the course. I have yet to see CMS walk away from a funding source. Now the tournament tells us that the funding agreement between TFA and the Wells Fargo Championship here at Quail Hollow, it's a year-to-year -year thing, no long-term contract or anything like that. And Bethany Darnley, that teacher we talked to in the story, well, she says after her two years of TFA teaching are over, she plans to stick around and stay on as a CMS teacher. Amy? Thanks so much, Jeff. Take a look at these numbers. Teach for America's website states it has 8,800 recruits currently teaching nationwide. And officials have placed 42,000 teachers in classrooms over the past 25 years. Now, the Charlotte Teach for America chapter is one of three in North Carolina. There are 52 TFA chapters all across the country. Next up, we'd like to do a little memory test. Can you sing your high school alma mater? I don't know too many people who can, but we're about to meet a woman who after 60 years remembers every single word. That's because she wrote them. I don't know how many of Myers Park High School's nearly 2,900 current students that can do that. Earlier this year, the principal came up with a way to celebrate the alma mater's 60th anniversary. Carolina Impact's Jeff Rivenbark has the story. When Emily Armstrong Williams plays the piano, you can almost feel a sense of passion echoing throughout her Myers Park home. She gets just as excited teaching others how to sing. So may thy glory, glory, so may thy glory. No, that's not too low, Jeff. This is not too high for you, darling. Just stand up and use your diaphragm. Even folks like me who have a hard time reading the notes. A music teacher for 40 years, she's taught lots of musicians. 
Earlier this year, Williams met Myers Park High School principal Mark Bosco. At the very end of the conversation, she said, and by the way, I wrote the alma mater. Wow, I was like, that's so amazing. And then she mentioned like that it was 60 years ago. Exactly. With graduation a few months away, Bosco came up with a plan. I first talked to Emily about coming and performing, and then I hooked her up with our chorus teacher, and they have been rehearsing for the past month almost every other day. Myers Park High School opened in 1951, but there was something missing during those early years. The Girls Ambassadors Club thought we needed a serious school song, basically an alma mater. So in 1954, they held a contest. I would say I probably worked on it a week or two before I actually wrote down the final manuscript. Unlike the other 12 entries, Williams' composition included original words and music. I tried to create something that was musically sound and would flow and was easy to sing and hymn-like, almost like an anthem. The student body picked William's song as the winner, and in 1955, the school officially adopted it as the alma mater. To mark the song's 60th anniversary, Principal Bosco asked Williams to take part in this year's graduation. The band plays pomp and circumstance as hundreds of graduates fill Time Warner Cable Arena. Williams sits on stage beside Principal Bosco. A few minutes later, he introduces Williams as the woman who composed the school's alma mater. She walks to the piano and plays it all the way through. And then the choir joins in. I can't explain how it thrilled me. The ceremony itself I thought was awesome. Beautifully done. While I was playing it and the chorus was singing it, it, it almost takes me somewhere else. Perhaps it takes her back 60 years ago, when the school dedicated the yearbook to Williams and the alma mater. To Emily Armstrong from the Girl Ambassadors of Myers Park High, 1955. And it was really a very, very special thing. It just touched me deeply at the time, and it does now. She turns each page, pointing to the alma mater's lyrics, woven like a ribbon among the black and white pictures. Hail Myers Park High School, we sing to thee, faithful forever and glorious be. Myers Park, we serve thee in loyalty, our alma mater forever to be. Williams says her family and her teaching career have been highlights in her life, but to have her song chosen as the alma mater so many years ago and to play it for the 60th anniversary is pretty special too. The alma mater was just one of the highlights of my life. That was the first thing that I did that I was so proud of. I think it's so important for us to hang on to some memories, hang on to some tradition, to have something to remember. Carolina Impact, I'm Jeff Rivenbark reporting. Thanks so much, Jeff. By the way, Emily Williams isn't slowing down a bit. She's the accompanist for three children's choirs at Myers Park Presbyterian Church. Well, from a woman musically gifted to one gifted in leading others, Kathy Basson is one of the most powerful executives in the nation's banking industry. She credits Girl Scouts for equipping her with skills she uses every single day. Recently, the nonprofit honored Basson in a very big way. Carolina Impact's Danielle Koser has more. Equipped with goggles, Girl Scouts gather at the headquarters of the Hornet's Nest Council for a quick lesson in science, joined by special guest Kathy Besant. There you go, you got it. Carefully following instructions, the young scientists drop a tissue filled with baking soda into a mixture of vinegar, water, and food coloring. Moments later, a symphony of popping fills the room. It really surprised me. I was like so scared. I was like, oh. Baking soda and vinegar produce carbon dioxide when mixed. Bubbling gas puts pressure on the bag, causing it to burst. Basant offers a less scientific explanation, taking center stage to tell the Girl Scouts explosions happen every day. 
She says being a leader can be messy, and this 33-year Bank of America veteran knows a lot about leadership. Recently named the company's chief operations and technology officer, Basant oversees more than 100,000 employees across 35 countries. She's also a member of the company's executive management team. She's smart, she's tough, she's energetic, and she gets the job done. And before she entered the world of C-suite executives, she donned this uniform. I've always been very proud to be a Girl Scout. I'm always reminiscing. I'm reminiscing and remembering the experiments that we did in our day. Very different, um, right? Much more rudimentary. The experiments have evolved, but Bassant says she still practices what she learned as a scout, citing the organization's decades-old slogan, do a good turn daily. I have a little yellow sticky note on my desk that reminds me to do three things every day. To connect with an employee, to build momentum for something positive, and to connect with a customer or someone in the community. That's the same thing as do a good turn every day. Her good deeds haven't gone unnoticed. This local council named Basant this year's Women of Distinction Lifetime Achievement Honoree, recognizing her commitment to lead with courage, confidence, and character. Her resume speaks for itself, but I think what's really important for us um, is that her Girl Scout experience kind of led the basis for where she is today. When you look around and say, who can we get to do something really important, we always think of Kathy. Hugh McCall, former Bank of America chairman and CEO, knows Basant well. The two met in the 80s, shortly after she joined the company as corporate banker in Texas. Kathy is a perfect example of some, uh, somebody who, I won't say has it all, but she's close. She's made a name for herself and she's done it through constant hard work. Basant's climb up the corporate ladder includes several senior leadership roles. Most recently, she worked as president of Global Corporate Banking. There is not a better person that's more deserving of a lifetime achievement award. Before joining Novant Health as chief consumer officer, Jesse Curitan spent several years working with Basant at Bank of America. And she was rallying the team to make a difference in the community. We built houses, we refurbished houses, we improved playgrounds in communities, and really made a difference. It was that passion uh, that Kathy started around community that really positioned Bank of America over the years to contribute hundreds of millions of dollars in the community. That took vision, it took leadership excellence, it took courage. I've always been one of those people that's willing to take on new challenges or to, um, to be bold and, and try new things uh, to fix tough problems. Outside the office, Basant stays busy serving the community. One of her current roles includes co-chairing Novant Health's $60 million capital campaign for a new heart and cancer treatment center. In March, Basant slipped on her dancing shoes for Charlotte Ballet's Dancing with the Stars fundraiser. She won the People's Choice Award for raising the most money, more than $225,000 for the Charlotte Ballet and the Buddy Kemp Cancer Support Center. She also served as chair of the Foundation for the Carolinas from 2010 to 2014. A beret on her head and a badge on her shoulder. This photo gives Girl Scouts a glimpse of how far they have the potential to go on a foundation of courage, confidence, and character. And so that they can see women like Kathy and interact with women like Kathy and say, you know, maybe I can do that someday. What young people should take from it is that, you know, you should reach for the sky because you can get there. You know the answers to that. Perhaps the most important line on Bassant's resume, serving as a role model for this next generation of leaders. The girls listen intently as she shares her story, explaining how a small town Michigan girl grew up to become one of Bank of America's most senior officers. For Carolina Impact, I'm Danielle Koser reporting. Thanks so much, Danielle. We're so lucky to have Kathy Basson in the studio with us this evening. We know her as the Chief Operations and Technology Officer at Bank of America. Kathy, thanks so much for your time. Amy, thanks for having me. We've had so much fun just talking leadership before we were able to start rolling tonight. But talk to us a little bit about your secret sauce. You have big dreams and big goals. How do you make those big, audacious dreams come true? Well, I think first is to have them. Um, I see a lot of times people have small incremental dreams or are afraid to dream or underestimate their own potential. I think step one is having the dream. Um, I've always said that I will never be outworked and I think there is no substitute for performance, no substitute for hard work or preparation. So if you want to, if you've got a big goal and you want to get after it, you've got to put your heart, mind and soul into it every single day. How do you find that talent? One of your goals I see is that you want to hire the five tech talent in the world 
for Bank of America. How do you find them? And it's always a bit of a risk when you hire new people at any business. How do you find the right ones, let alone the best tech talent? Well, it starts from the perspective that if you run an organization from a technology and operating perspective as large as Bank of America, you have to have the top five talent in the world. Otherwise, you don't have talent that's capable of managing at the scope and scale that we have to manage every day on behalf of customers and clients. So it's really a business imperative, I think, to do that. Once you recognize that it's a business imperative, I think having a technology and operating brand that attracts talent, you know, the average technologist does not think of a bank as a great place to build their technology career. But then you've got to be, once you attract them, to come talk to you. You've got to be great at understanding who's good and who's not as good as they look on a piece of paper. So we do rigorous interviewing. Um, we do interviewing at many levels, at the peer level, at the subordinate level, at the boss level. And we try to be very direct and open with people who are making midlife or executive um, changes. We try to be very open with people about what they should expect, what the culture is all about, so that we can both assess their ability to fit and then increase their likelihood of success. So you hire great people in their functionality roles, but how do you grow them to be great leaders so that you're not the one having to make all the decisions? Well, first of all, they have to want to be great leaders. The thing about people who are great at their function is they value often mostly what's in their function and not the more general skill set that it takes to be a great leader. And so we do it um, the way many companies do, but we do it with stretch assignments. We do it with active coaching and, and very direct uh, ways of saying, you can be great at writing code or you can be great at producing a commercial, but if you're not great at managing teams and leading people toward an objective, at the end of the day, you'll have a career with a termination point that is probably lower than the one you want. Talk to us a little bit about, we've all heard the phrase, you can't teach an old dog new tricks, but uh, you have a little spin on that. Well, I think seasoned dogs have to be um, willing to learn new tricks. You know, when Ken Lewis called me and said, I want you to come be the chief marketing officer, I had been running businesses. I, I asked him what I had done wrong to have to come in and learn a new discipline. Um, when I came into the technology and operations role, I had never been, and I'm certainly not trained as a technologist. I can actually program in COBOL, no good to me or anyone else these days. But I think it starts with a willingness to take a risk. Um, you have to be a voracious learner. You've got to find safe places to learn. And you've got to remember why you got the job in the first place. Even if it's not your area of skill, there are skills that got you into the role that you have to leverage while you're learning your way into the functional discipline. I think. It's exciting to see how much you've grown even within the same organization. Many times these days people are switching careers, switching uh, companies. You've survived three decades of what I would suspect it has been uh, a lot, if not constant change, certainly a lot of change within the banking industry. How do you survive things like that and make yourself as valuable as you are to the average person at home sitting there watching just wanting to make a difference? Well, I call it the simple cockroach approach. <laughs> um, but it does, but I have been very fortunate in that while I have been at the bank since 1982, the bank is very different today than it was um, when I joined. Sort of a regional bank to now a global bank, um, a very traditional bank to now a, a broad-based, full-service financial institution. And so I've been lucky that opportunities have come from the way the bank has changed. That said, that reinvention point you made earlier becomes very important because you have to be willing to see the risks and the opportunities that are in front of you, get out of your comfort zone, and frankly, um, oftentimes take horizontal moves in order to have the opportunity to learn and then advance at double pace. Kathy Bassan, I could sit and talk leadership with you all day long, but unfortunately we're out of time. Thank you so much for your great information. Amy, thanks again. Finally tonight, we launch a new monthly segment we hope you'll love as we explore interesting places to visit not too far from home. The first stop lands us right here in Charlotte. The Carolinas Aviation Museum highlights more than 100 years of aviation history, including a model of the Wright Brothers Flyer and the U.S. Airways plane that made a crash landing in the Hudson River just a few years ago. Producer Russ Hunsinger takes us on this one tank trip. Come fly with me, let's fly, let's fly away. The Carolinas Aviation Museum is a collection of aircraft that tell stories about people who shaped aviation history. To do a loop, what you do is you'd get way up high, 
Then you would push the yoke in. Through the years, they got a collection of planes and uh, we were able to just build on that and uh, create a really unique museum. You move it back and forth. I was learning how you make a loop and um, learning how like the um, you go left and white. What we try to do is we try and tell stories people can relate to. I can talk about how magnificent a piece of machinery they are and how fast they fly and how high they go. But really what connects you to them is the people behind the planes. And so we, we use the planes actually as a backdrop of telling the stories of the people behind them. Now on our plane the emergency, our plane just passed into the Hudson River. The miracle on the Hudson, the fact that we were able to get that airplane, it's such an amazing artifact. And the thing about that aircraft is that when people come and see it, they're pretty much in awe because that's not something that you would normally see in a museum. An airplane that was in an incident where everybody on board survived, you can actually place yourself there. So when you see the, the personal effects, that could have been you. I like the miracle on the Hudson plane just because it was so cool how um, they landed in the river. I hope they understand the miracle on the Hudson better. And I also uh, wanted them to see the airplanes that their grandfather used to fly when he was in the Navy. 737 coming out of the sky. Oh, won't you take me down to Memphis on a midnight ride? I won't move. I think this is the parachute. So if you were all buckled in, his great-grandfather was a Navy pilot. So we wanted to introduce him to a little bit of aviation history and maybe somewhere along the line it'll spark some type of a interest in aviation and maybe he'll become a pilot. There's lots of different unique planes, like there's some with boats inside that can go underwater. There's some with skis, there's some with wheels. There's even some that are very tiny, like blue box over there. So there's one for the instructor and one for the student. When I get bigger, I want to fly this airplane. I want them to take away a sense of inspiration. I think every one of, of these planes has an inspirational story to it. When you come in here, I think you're going to see something that you didn't expect, and you're going to leave here going, you know, I was inspired by the stories and about the people behind these planes, and that's what I want people to take away with them. You know, I didn't even realize that that was right here in Charlotte. It looks like a lot of fun. The Carolinas Aviation Museum is open every day except New Year's, Easter, Thanksgiving, and Christmas. For more information, head to our website at pbscharlotte.org. If you've got a story idea for us about a one-tank trip, we'd love to hear from you. Very easy to just send us an email. All you have to do is send it to carolinaimpact at wtvi.org. Here's something else for you. Be sure to friend us on Facebook for a chance to win monthly prizes. This month, we're giving away a family four-pack to the Renaissance Festival. From all of us here at Carolina Impact, thanks so much for joining us. We hope to see you back here again next time. Good night, my friends. Funding for Carolina Impact is provided by the members of WTVI PBS Charlotte and by... The Philip L. Van Every Foundation is pleased to support our region's arts organizations and artists with profiles and feature stories on Carolina Impact. A production of WTVI-PBS Charlotte.